do you think that this will stop me to have my way and my day, says the Spirit of God? For watch, I say to you, why do you fear? Do you think that I fear the very words of men? Do you think that I fear the weaponry of the nations? Do you think that I fear even the day of those who prognosticate and say that this land is finished, that the earth belongs to the enemy? No, it is mine and it is my time, says the living God. You have seen what corruption looks like. You have seen what perversion, wickedness, and chaos, what it looks like. Yet I say to you, there is a shift that is taking place and it is moving in the heavens and it shall shake this earth in a way that you have not seen it shaken before. Therefore, pay attention, for they have masqueraded, making you think that things are a certain way and they have masturbated themselves making you think they are who they say they are but God says I am coming not only to shake but to expose and to reveal at the time of my justice therefore I will give the earth a sign of what I speak of at this time for what has been shall be again in the window of grace that is open and shall be open to bring about a restoration and I will restore the years that have been stolen from you and God says I will give you something easy to remember as you close out this year as the Jewish New Year is about to arise and you enter into a new calendar year this shall be the work of my hands I shall restore in 24 I will bring about the things that you have prayed and the things that you have desired. For there has been too much lies and too much counterfeit. Therefore, I will bring about one, a man who will stand again strong. And I will bring, listen to me now, as the Son of God spoke from the cross. And he said, behold, look. And he spoke to a woman his mother I say to you that this is the hour that the earth will behold the woman will behold the mother you say why is this because there has been that which has come to try to redefine what a woman is that I have created and redefine the role of womanhood and, and a mother Yet I say to you, I will counter what they have thought their definition would stand in this time. And here's how I will do it, says the Lord. It will be as in the days of Deborah. When one arose as a mother, pay attention, my hand is upon one. And she shall carry my will and my agenda that shall help to heal the discord the division and rescue the children at this time says the living God pay attention oh, lift up your hands as you lift up your hands today not only is there a divine shifting that is taking place across the earth says the living God but as Moses' hands were lifted in the day of battle, do not think it is a light thing that your hands being lifted now is just something that you are doing in the natural. God says, if I was to open your eyes and some even now, you are seeing that it is affecting the spirit realm. It is affecting realms beyond your own human understanding or knowledge. But God says, listen, as your hands are being lifted today, there is a shifting that is taking place in the spirit realm. And there are certain battles that you have faced in your nation. Yes, I speak even of laptops. I speak of emails. I speak of blackmailing. I speak of that which has been in justice and that which has gone through the courts. God says, as your hands are being lifted, do you understand? that this 
is the moment that there is a shift that will begin to be seen because I will show you as I've said you have seen enough evil now you will see my goodness pass before the earth at this time come on lift it up shout 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 come on give God one more shout shout unto God with a voice of triumph come on lift up your voice let God arise let God arise let God arise thank you Lord thank you Lord now I want you to say with me we stand as one in the unity of your of the faith of your spirit to open ears to hear and help your servant Lord to actually speak what you want to say in Jesus name amen, amen. amen. All right, first of all, let me give you, a, I'm going to share with you something that I think is extremely important. It's a picture. The reason why I use this great whiteboard over here is because um, I never have a technological problem with this. I never have a PowerPoint problem. <laughs> it's ancient technology. The apostles travel with whiteboards, whether you know it or not. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw some verses out for you. I want to write them down real quick. And, and Mark 4 says, uh, what, what is it? Mark 4:33. Jesus spoke the word as they were able to hear it. Ah, here we go. Uh, in Mark 4. Where's the verse the Bible says, Jesus said to take heed what you hear. We'll find it somewhere in there. Take heed what you hear. So here's, here's the problem right now. We have this voice of propaganda going out into the earth. And because of that voice, uh, we have the, uh, the challenge of Satan is speaking. And you have to be guarding yourself and taking heed what you hear. Because uh, with what measure you, you, uh, you meet, it shall be measured to you. Uh, and, 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 and you shall be given more. What that's talking about is the way that you hear and what you hear determines whether your faith is increasing or decreasing. It determines whether you're moving in greater anxiety and fear or whether you're moving in greater strength. What I want to share with you now is a perspective of end time events that empowers you in the midst of adversities and setbacks. So here's, here's the picture. I want you to think about the, uh, the image of what the shaking is. So you heard uh, Pastor Hank talk about shaking and about the heavens and such. Well, imagine this. Jesus says that he told the Pharisees when he was being on his trial, he said, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That's uh, clouds of heaven or Lord of hosts. It refers to the angelic armies of heaven. So Jesus is literally coming with an, with an army entourage and he's coming back to earth because he's, he's coming back to occupy the planet. He is returning. In between third heaven up here where Jesus is, is this realm here which is where spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So now you've got, let me get my, uh, I'll go with a red pen. Hold on a second. So here I'll put some pitchforks over here so you know what I'm talking about. So Jesus is coming down out of third heaven, and, and there's resistance here in this sphere. Now I'll show you in a second where the prophet Haggai, who is the one that really uses the term and introduces, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. This comes from an Old Testament prophet. And if you don't know the story, you'll just think of some random scripture floating around there in the Old Testament. But it isn't a random scripture. It's connected to the Cyrus times of history. Because Haggai shows up, when Cyrus shows up, and Trump is a type of Cyrus, as a matter of fact, the first time it was, I was with Kim, I was supposed to meet Trump, first, my first time, with Kim Clement, and uh, we had a meeting with him, and Kim didn't make it. This is the first time he went to the hospital. I'm waiting for him over there in the Trump boardroom. And uh, after that meeting, when the Lord says, every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want to do, I was really confused. And I was thinking, well, I like it when I was traveling with Kim, because he'd hear, and I'd clarify. It was great. He'd be Moses, I'd be Aaron. I didn't have any burden to have to hear anything. I'd have to interpret what the heck he was talking about. <laughs> and he would call me and say, what does this mean? He'd have a prophecy and then ask me, what does it mean? Because my job was the prophetic teacher, the Levite. I interpreted, I interpret his tongues. So, so anyway, he wasn't there. So I'm at home and, I, and it was the weirdest thing. I had to, for the moment, I had access to him hearing. And I hear a voice like a ticker tape going through my left ear. The next president of the United States will be an Isaiah 45 president. The 45th president will be Isaiah 45. The next president will be Isaiah 45. I'm thinking, 45th president, next president, Isaiah 45. I thought, eh, this is so clear. This has to be a deceiving spirit. I never hear, spirit, I never hear God that clear. 
So I thought, the Bible says, test the spirits, try the spirits. There'll be many deceiving spirits. And so I, I right away went to Google to go test it. And I go, I enter in and I go, what is the next number for the next president? And it says 45. I thought, oh, all right, we're on to something here. Then I go to Isaiah, I probably should start with Isaiah 45. Go to Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I've anointed, to go through the two leaf gates of Babylon, and I will break the gates of brass asunder, and I'm going to make the crooked places straight. And, and so the, I'm reading this stuff, and then it goes on to say, I'm going to undo the belts of my adversaries, I'm going to have the treasures of darkness, and all this I'm going to do for my people's sake. Israel, God's going to do it because of us. And then the Lord says this, though you do not know me, which means that the guy Cyrus isn't necessarily an evangelical tongue-talking Pentecostal. Right. Matter of fact, for the Jews in Isaiah's time, what in the world are you saying you're anointing someone to do all this and it's not the Messiah from our Judah tribe? They were looking for their own military leader. And God's sending a foreigner? It's confusing. So meanwhile, all the Christians, typical Christians, sorry to say, we want to know, first we want to know is, you know, well, is the candidate a Christian? Well, how, listen, I don't want to know, uh, to be honest with you, if I'm on a plane in a storm, I want to have the most experienced pilot possible. I don't want to have the, late, the latest graduate from ORU who thinks they are a pilot. I want somebody who actually has, even better if they've been in World War II or something like that. Or, I want experience. You go in for surgery, ladies. If you ever have to have uh, some kind of surgery or something like that, you want the, you want the best Jewish doctor in the hospital. So here's the deal. So, so I'm looking at this and we go, well, the Cyrus is evidently not in our tribe, okay? So I'm looking at that and it was a bizarre thing. But that was when something opened up for me. And I remember, ding, 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 wait a second. This is, this, is a complicated, this is a complex picture, but you guys can all handle it. We are living in a prophetic period of time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Hey, guy, comes along at the time of Cyrus to prophesy to the Jewish people that you're missing the point of Cyrus being here. You're supposed to be building something. And so the Jewish people weren't building. They were supposed to be building an overcoming house for the nation. Before I didn't interrupt your history for you to just have four years and you do what you want to do. I want my church to be raised up. So, so this, you, it's important you get this. Heaven is in the process of invading planet Earth. The prophet Haggai says that uh, God prophesies, I'm going to shake everything that can't be shaken. I'm going to shake. And then the word heavens is used, plural. What does that mean? That there's layers in the heavens that where principalities and powers and dominions and powers of darkness occupy. They're the ones being shaken. But what do we know from Hebrews? Interesting scripture says, but you are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So when it says everything's going to shake, the only place it doesn't shake is this. Amen. Heaven doesn't shake. Yeah. It's an unshakable kingdom. And the unshakable kingdom is actually trying to make its path into earth right here, trying to get to you so that you are standing in the circle of an unshakable kingdom. Yeah. Meanwhile, hell is under siege. That's why you're seeing more and more demonic manifestations of, of, of weirdness that's in the culture. And I'll show you why. Because what's happening here, now take a look at this, is uh, there's a great verse in the Bible. Oh, you, look at this. You guys are so fast. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. If you've got a Bible, circle the word promise. Because most people look at this shaking as though it's an end time tribulation warning, and you hope that you're not here. But God says it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because the shaking is what God promised he was going to do in order to deal with this whole realm of rebellion in his agenda. They're the thing that is shaking. And everything that's connected to them is shaking down here on planet Earth. What I want you to see is this. Jesus is invading already. He's already started his mop-up operation. You have to catch this. And because of that... These forces are being driven out of their, of their position here, and that's why you're seeing an increase in darkness down here. They're being pushed out. Mankind is getting more under the influence of them. But at the same time that the darkness is increasing, heaven is closer than it's ever been. This is the other part. This is why Isaiah says, if you get this revelation, it'll, it'll tell you why 
You're not, your faith cannot be subject to, I just want to see an end to this thing because it's, because it's going to increase. Yeah. We're in the time, it's, it's likened unto a woman is about ready to give birth to a baby. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the contractions don't minimize, they get more intense yeah. Yeah. until the new thing is born and the new age is coming and the Messiah is returning. So it's going to increase. So here, let's go over this again. Third heaven is up here. Second heaven is here. First heaven is around this atmosphere here. Third heaven is invading planet Earth, coming down. Satan is resisting. Satan is being pushed out of his position. As that happens, darkness starts to cover the Earth. But upon you, there's greater glory. Does that, does that make sense to you? Now, the reason why this is, this is so critically important is because when the powers of heaven are shaken and, the, and you see the lawlessness increasing in the earth, those things are all very biblical. But you have to know that there's another aspect of this, which is we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken so that the gospel of the kingdom can be proclaimed. So the contrast between us and that is being forced in the same way that the Jews had a contrast with Egypt. God is putting a contrast between his people and the people in the world. So that you're seeing this, this, this darkness and light tension is going to increase. For you, what that means is, as Satan is being pushed down, remember what Jesus said? And when these things begin to happen, at the very beginning, you're in it now, look up. Because your redemption is coming to a theater near you. Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, that word draweth nigh is fascinating. One day, the Lord said to me, look that up. I said, look it up, draweth nigh. I, I, I look it up, it's in Gizzo, in Gizio. It literally means when Jesus drew nigh unto Bethany, when Jesus drew near unto where the, the, the child was that was with a funeral, and he comes and touches uh, the funeral uh, uh, you know, uh, basket there, and then the kid pops out. The word draws nigh literally means proximity geographically as well as near on the calendar. We read it like, well, you know, if the Lord comes back, it's going to, the day is getting closer. It's not just the day, it's the actual kingdom of God is invading and it's in greater proximity now than ever before. So you look, you look up because the kingdom of heaven is in Ginzo. It's literally coming near to you. The reason why you can't see it is the darkness is also nearer to you. So that means you've really got to increase your prayer life and pull out all the plugs, break everything in you that is connected to the wrong realm. Because if you're not, if you're not, in a sense it's a great thing. Because as the shaking happens and the pressure increases, every area in you that isn't in the unshakable kingdom dimension is going to start to manifest. And so you have to bring it down under the authority. This is why you're going to see the bride has made herself ready. Because the pressure of circumstances at work. Does this make sense so far? So when you look, when you look at this, and the picture becomes more chaotic as I keep moving. As third heaven invades and comes back, and you see Haggai's prophecy that God is going to shake the heavens and the earth, there's another aspect of this. And the aspect is that what is God shaking things out to? Strange prophecy in the middle of all the shaking. Haggai says, ah, but the silver is mine and the gold is mine. And I'm going to be building my temple in the midst of it. Well, this is a crazy verse. In the middle of all this shaking and warning, God says that I'm going to be building a temple. And what's the temple in the end times? It's going to be the overcoming body of Christ. It's a different temple than the one that they were looking for, a physical building. So this temple is you. And God says the silver, which means there's no limitation to the resource allocation and movement of heaven to get to his people what they need for a glorious church. Which is why that exhortation at the beginning, you don't, you don't look at the wind. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something. Your sowing in an adverse economic time has more power than your sowing in a good economic time. Because there's more faith and sacrifice attached to you sowing during a tough time than it is when you're just, you know, operating off the surplus of your cash flow. All right, so let's see. I'm, I got 10 minutes here. Or what? I ended at 1040? 1020? 1030? 1040. All right, can you get me a water up here so that uh, I have any questions on this? Heaven 
coming to a theater near you, hell coming to a theater near you. You have to choose which theater you go to. You have to take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. It's interesting that Jesus gave two different aspects. The what you hear is be careful about the sources. And I noticed something. The people that listen to like MSNBC and CNN, the folks that are under the influence, really the influence of this bizarre uh, worldview. Yes. I mean, if I was listening to a newscaster that was telling me about Russia, 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 and then find the whole thing was, was a ripoff and made no sense, and they got pulled as a surprise, and I find that the whole thing is fiction. I wouldn't keep on listening. Listen. But, but that shows you there's a spirit. It's like, well, let's move on to the next deception. And it's like, oh, Trump has papers in Mar-a-Lago he should go to jail for. Okay, paper, paper sins, whatever that is. <laughs> so, meanwhile, what was he being impeached for? Oh, he said something about you know, Biden's corrupt in Ukraine, they should look into it. Oh, what are we finding out? Biden's corrupt and he got recorded with his voice on it. He says, I didn't know anything about what my son was doing. They got a paper trail like 10 to $17 million floating around in the family. It's, it's all there. It's all, it takes five years to come out because nobody wants to talk about it, but it's there and it's coming out all the time. My point is this, that group that is listening to that, because they don't take heed what they hear, they keep exposing themselves to this mesmerizing spirit. And it continues to seduce them into confusion. So they're not coming out of it. You've got to be careful what you expose yourself to. And then the second caveat is you can't always protect yourself from what you're exposed to. How many of you know? It's like you're going to be exposed because this, this, the devil is propagandizing everywhere. You're going to have someone near you who's going to bring you propaganda. So then you have to take the second part, take heed how you hear because here's the key, to him who has the right way of hearing, more hearing shall be given. That's the interpretation of that verse. To him who has, shall more be given. Have what? Has the ability to hear what the Spirit is saying. So you want to be very careful that you're hearing what the Spirit is saying, because if you're not hearing what the Spirit is saying, during this process of shaking contradictions, overturning disappointments, and darkness coming down, there's potential for a great falling away. Because you're focused on the wrong information, and here's why I'm showing you this now. You have to know what's behind the chaos. You have to know that it's actually an indication that something's good. When the woman starts going, when my wife says to me, oh, I think I'm ready. You know, when you have three children. Well, when she says she thought she was ready, uh, you know, I, I jumped because uh, she, knew, she knew she was ready. But her first child, she had completely misunderstood the time. Her dad's an obstetrician, but she still didn't get it. We, didn't, we were inexperienced. I'll never forget, I'm over there in the hospital. And uh, she goes, oh, you know, I think I'm ready. I go, all right. And, uh, but right before that happened, I had a, like, a, a, like a little kit with me, and she saw this little bag I had, like a gym bag. And in my gym bag, back in Walkman days, I had these Walkmans with all these worship CDs and all these teaching CDs. She said, what's that? I said, well, this is what I'm going to be doing while you're in labor there. I'm going to be... I'm going to be staying, standing in the gap, keeping my spirit up there, praying for you. She's, she starts laughing. She goes, you're not going to be listening to anything when I'm going through labor. You're going to be right there. <laughs> Reading books and listening to music. You're not going to do that. And she's laughing. And while she's laughing, she goes, oh, 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 tell them I'm ready. So I go down the hallway. And I, and I don't know how to do this, but there's this, like, nurse's station down there. And I go out like you're hailing a cab. I go, hello, hello, out the room. Right here, we're ready. I figure they're going to come up and pick up my wife and cart her off. Well, it's, I'm standing there, and this little short little lady in these white, this white scrubs and these sneakers, squeaky sneakers on that, I remember that floor, and come squeak, no urgency at all, squeak, squeak, squeak. And she's walking up to me, steely blue eyes, no smile. She comes up to me. I said, I think my wife's ready. She goes, was that your wife I heard laughing? I said, yes, that was my wife you heard laughing. She said, let me tell you something, Sonny. If she's, la if she's laughing, she's not ready. So, I kind of walked back, backed into the room there, kind of like Roy Scheider in Jaws when he said, we need a bigger boat. My wife goes, well, what happened? I go, well, she says we have a few minutes. She was right. When she was ready, she wasn't laughing. So this, so this period of travail that comes upon the church, this period of, oh, this agonizing type of prayer, is good because it's the birthing prayer. It's, it's, we're living in the period of great contradictions. When, the, when, the, when Satan is being so 
forceful over wanting to exert His will. And we need a defiant church, not a compliant church. We need a defiant church. The Lord doesn't want you resigning yourself to defeat. He wants you contradicting the information. Does that make sense to you? So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So, so in Luke chapter uh, 8, let's go to chapter 8, 18. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Luke 8, 18. See if the verse is... Uh, Well, where is that? Take heed what you hear. I don't even know. I wrote these verses down crazy today. Take heed. Oh, yeah. Take heed. Verse 18. Take heed how you hear, for whoever has to him uh, more will be given. So you got to be careful how you process the unbelief of Christians and the um, flat out deception of the unbeliever. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Now, as I was reading this, I'm, I'm going down and I look at that. So Jesus, Jesus is going on in this, in this chapter. And uh, we go down to chapter 4, keep going, and uh, there were many demons that were coming out right then. Demons are coming out. And so Jesus, Jesus is on, on his way to minister. And uh, let me see. Where is the verse where, where there's the, the girls? He goes to the uh, Jairus' house. He says, that, that my daughter is grievously ill. And she... Is that Mark 5? All right, let's take a look at this. And it's Luke 8 also, right? Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. So it was when Jesus, that the multitude welcomed him, but they were all waiting. Behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age. She was dying. And so there's this woman having this issue of blood that takes place. And Jesus perceives that virtue goes out from him. But the great point there is that Jesus wasn't trying to heal her. She had so exercised her faith that she reached into his realm and pulled out what she needed. Now stop and think about that. This has nothing to do with whether it's God's will to heal you. Your faith can get to the place where you extract from God exactly what you need. So all this stuff is like important. And so he says that now, while he was still speaking, verse 49, here we go. Someone came from the ruler, ruler of the synagogue, house, synagogue comes to him saying, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Remember what Jesus just taught. Take heed how you hear. There's nothing more discouraging for a healing ministry than to hear that the person you're going to go pray to get healed is dead. <laughs> Spirit of death and unbelief and sorrow and everybody's going to be mourning and wailing. He's going to show up. There's going to be a whole... Jewish demonstration of catastrophe. And he's got to overcome all of it because he's already heard a different word. He's on his way because the father told him he's going to raise the girl up. So watch this. While he's still speaking, while he's still speaking about faith, go in peace. The word comes, hey, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered and says, don't be afraid, only believe she's going to be made well. In other words, he grabbed it right away. Before it could get into the Father's heart, and he had to overcome his resistance because his faith was what was pulling Jesus in for a miracle. So his, his unbelief could disrupt the flow of a miracle. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except for Peter and James and John and the father and mother of the girl. And all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep, she's not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed. He puts them outside. This is kind of interesting too. This is why sometimes... In order for God to do what he wants to do, he has to remove some people from the room. There are some conversations when you're, when you're really working on, a, on an issue regarding what God is calling you to do, where you have to be careful that you're not talking to the wrong people about it because you might change what God is saying to you based on the wrong people in the room. He put them all outside, took her by the hand and called, saying, Talitha Kumi, little girl arise, and her spirit immediately returned to her. Her spirit goes into her and she revives. And that goes to the second part of what I want to talk about. When the Spirit goes into you. If the shaking is happening here, I contend that the shaking is designed to prepare an overcoming people, a bride, prepared for the, for the bridegroom. I believe that Satan is being progressively cast down. And I think we have a total misunderstanding of Revelation chapter 12, a very powerful chapter, where it talks about Satan being cast out of the heavens, and every preacher wants to go and say, this is what happened to him in the beginning. Yes, it's what happened to him in the beginning, but the book of Revelation is about those things that must shortly come to pass. It's about the future. And what you find is, 
This very process, Revelation chapter 12, you see like in verse 8, Satan is being squeezed out and, and he's at war with the angels and he's at war with the Lord of hosts, the angelic hosts. But he's not winning because he's getting squeezed out of his position and he prevailed not, neither was there found any more place in heaven or in the heavenlies. Not third heaven, but the second heavens. Go to the next verse. Can you guys go to the next verse? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan was deceived the whole world. He was cast out where? Oh, this is interesting, into the earth. What does that mean? He loses this whole position and now has to operate at this level. This is when you have your great distress among the nations. This is when you have everything that's going crazy. It's progressively leading to this moment. Because Satan is losing ground, it's manifesting here. Meanwhile, the contractions in the church are increasing, as that goes on, because God's birthing of the kingdom. And the Messiah is about to show up and wrap up history. Does this make sense to you? So this whole process is happening. And while it's happening, you're feeling the increase of this pressure, which is why I'm going to, I'll start something here and I'll pick it up in the second service. You guys can get the uh, broadcast and watch it. When the, uh, when the spirit of that girl revived that Jesus prayed for and her spirit came back into her, it reminds me of, of the story that uh, I got from, from uh, Kim Clement when he was praying for a, a businessman who was a realtor in uh, Conyers, Georgia. And he calls the man out and he says, Sir, stand up. The Lord tells me that you are, you are going, to, uh, you're going to be in political office and that you're going to have a son named Caleb and your son is going to be uh, also walking in a political office. This is God's plan for you. The guy's name is Mike Crott. Mike goes from real estate into running for the state legislator as a state senator. He's like at the Marriott Hotel doing like a, a speech and he drops down dead outside from a heart attack. And I, I see the video of uh, the, uh, the ambulance. It's 10 minutes for the ambulance to get there. And then they're trying to resuscitate him for five. They can't get a heartbeat. They go 10 minutes off to, back to the hospital. They try to revive him there for like 10 minutes. The guy's been like dead for like 38 minutes or so, 40 minutes. They call his wife in, Phyllis, young, charismatic, new to the prophetic. She comes in and they say, your husband is an organ donor. We need you to sign so that we can start taking the organs out. Well, she's not ready for that. She goes, I got I to gotta get in there. She goes in there. And she starts prophesying over him and says, Michael, the word of the Lord says you're going to have a son. Your son's going to be named Caleb, and he's going to walk in the same steps as his father. Now they had adopted a boy named Caleb. He said, I saw these territories where God's people were standing, and as everything shook, these believers were standing in territory that could not be shaken. And Jesus showed me this lake with his people, and he was showing me that I had a calling to be in government, that I had an assignment, that when believers are doing their God-given assignment, they're standing in a territory where heaven wants to come in and invade it. And if heaven invades it, then it's an unshakable territory. And if it's shaking, then it's okay. It's just trying to shake you up, to shake out of you, whatever's shakeable. Does that make sense? See, he's always calling me. He says, Liz, it's seven mountains. I'm convinced it's what God was trying to show me when I was up in heaven. You've got to get this. We've got to get this message out. So, that, so, then, so that got me on this whole area of the seven mountains. I'm going to drop it here, and then I'm going to, I'm going to pick it up in the next service. Seven mountains says this. If we're literally living... In a period of time, put a little flag there, if we're living in a time where uh, shaking is happening, yeah. then I know that Satan is coming down. It explains to me something. It explains why media is becoming weaponized by darkness, yeah. why corporate America is being weaponized by wokeness, yeah. why government is becoming fascist and accusing you of being a fascist. In other words, academia is becoming more militant and intolerant. I realize why darkness is increasing because, if you don't mind me saying so, the high places at the top of these mountains is not territory we focused on. Most of this church over here focuses on going to heaven or getting souls saved to come into church. We don't actually think about making disciples of nations, of going into the animation field of cartoons. We don't think about buying Twitter and making it a free platform. We don't think about a private real estate guy like Trump going in and saying, I'm going to interrupt the game and give it back to the people. So what happens is the church has this take heed how you hear and take heed what you hear. And we haven't had the right teaching for so long that Christians are right now escape artists. They're all Harry Houdinis. They either got their bug out bag and they're ready anyway. That's the logic of the church, which is extremely selfish if you ask me. So you're going to get out and everybody else is going to suffer. That's really benevolent. 
So here you go. You got the church here. You got family here. You've got education. You got government. You got the media. You have the arts and entertainment field. And then you've got business. Each of those spheres has its own hierarchy of hell that occupies the high places. You got, and I work with these seven mountains. I work, so if you're in the corporate world, it's different than the political world. If you're in the, if you're in the uh, arts world, it's going to be somewhat different than the media world. What, what's the difference between the media and the arts? Media is supposed to be like the news telling you what reality is. Arts is supposed to be a suspension of reality to entertain you. But here's the point. Each of these spheres has a place where the gates of hell is located. And I ask the average Christian, where's the gates of hell? Well, where do you think they really are? Well, they're up there in the spirit somewhere. Actually, the gates of hell are very interested in occupying those areas. Why do I know that? Because when Jesus was uh, talking to the devil on the Mount of uh, Temptation, and Jesus was uh, there at that time, Satan said, all of this has been given to me, and I give it to whom I will. Therefore, if you'll bow down, you can have all the kingdoms of this world. He showed him all the kingdoms. And this is what you can say the sub-kingdoms are under those kingdoms. Jesus said, and what the devil boasted was, it was given to me. Sorry about that. Your guy, Adam, you created it for man. Man betrayed you, gave it to me. So why don't you and I work out a deal? Jesus didn't argue with him. It had to have been a real temptation or it's not a temptation. He evidently had the ability, but the boast was he gives it to whom he will, which is why you have such warfare over a Supreme Court appointment, why you have such warfare over a presidency, because Satan wants to give it to whom he wants at the top of that, and God, if God's people are praying, has his own idea of who he wants at the top of that. Because what works here is the same principle that works in church, the power of agreement. And so you want to have the right people where the gates are located. All right, final thought. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell. So we're going to have my church. Jesus has my church over here. But he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, if you're over here, how do you deal with these things? Well, the truth is you're supposed to go ye into all the world. For some reason, we thought go ye in all the world means just go and preach church stuff and build a wall, which is why you have all this sound of freedom talks about uh, sex trafficking in all these nations, and I promise you, some of them are 50% of the population go to church and the cartels could care less because they're still running because the church isn't interfering with the cartels. They've got the corrupt business people in their pocket. But if you go into all the world, that means geographically you're in Mozambique, but then systemically you get into government, you get into business, you get into journalism. You get, into, you get into animation and cartoons. So the point is, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So I believe God's raising up a people that are going into these areas. Why? Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the ecclesia. And the ecclesia only requires two or more and I am in the midst of you. So if you've even got, and I, first time I saw this, I said, Lord, this sounds like a heresy, crazy thought. Lord said, it's already in the Bible. It's even in the Old Testament. Lord, show me. In Babylon, Daniel has Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's got his Hebrew friends with him in the house. They were in charge of the Babylonian government. And they had a house church. That's where Daniel got the revelation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The Lord said, already in the Old Testament right there, I showed my ecclesia at the top of the Babylonian government as an end time proposition. I want my Daniels in proximity to the throne of power, and I want my people in proximity to the gates of hell. Wow. Yeah. So right there, we're supposed to be going into. Yeah. So now, if you've got a vision like this, my friend, you should be telling your children, your sons and your daughters, that rather than, well, you better get ready. Jesus is coming back any day because the Antichrist is coming. You ought to be preparing them for Jesus coming back any day, and he wants you occupying till he comes. Yeah. Yeah. He wants you occupying. He doesn't want you preoccupied with when he gets here. He wants you occupying territory. What Michael Crotch saw was that you're going to be standing in territory that cannot be shaken. Lord of Hosts Church wants to equip you, I'm certain. Only so many of you can be over here employed by the church mountain. I'm Ashkenazi Jew. I'm a Levite on my father's side. I come from a whole generation of rabbis. I'm going to tell you something. you got a Pentecostal Levite, a tongue-talking Levite talking to you right now. In, in Israel, only 10% of the people were over here in the temple. 
90% were out occupying the promised land. If, you don't see, if you're going to see America is going to be saved and you're praying for America to be saved and you're all fixated on who's going to be the next president, recognize if you don't occupy, it explains why media and government and business is weaponized against us because we're not going up against the